you because you've already been good morning so many times, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Good morning. <laughs> There was, like a, there was actually a moment of offense almost right there. Some people, how dare you? No, we're glad you're here, and it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to worship with you this morning. And I get to preach again. I preached last week, and, and I'm going to pick up on that. We ended our series on the purpose-driven life last week, and, and I shared about the Holy Spirit. And the reason I did that, and, and Mark and I felt so strongly about that, is we can't be in our purpose without the Holy Spirit. Our purpose, our mission, has to be centered in the power of of the Spirit, okay? And, uh, and so I, I, I kind of highlighted a, a key thing that's central to my life, even the way I think, using this little graphic, and, and that basically without re-preaching the whole sermon, is that we are the pre- in the presence of God because of Jesus, because of what he's done, we are now the living temple. We are now the presence of God on earth. And just as Jesus went into the world and wherever he went, he brought the kingdom of heaven so are we to do the same thing. He, he, remember, he breathed on the disciples and he said, he, he said, receive the Holy Spirit so as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And so we, are, the church, our mission, our purpose, of who we are is to be the people of God in the midst of the darkness. That's what we're supposed to do. His presence, wherever we are, his presence touching earth with heaven. Remember how he taught us to pray And I I hope you never forget this, not just as rote memory, but remember this as as who we are. When he said, Father in heaven, holy or hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just about going to heaven, although we do go to heaven, but it's about getting heaven here. And that's who we are, that's what we're supposed to do. And I want to build on that because, as I talked about, we struggle to kind of walk in that power. So I want to start by looking at, at Ephesians 5, 15 through 25. Paul says this, be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And remember, he means be being filled. As I said last week, he's not just talking about be filled and that's it. He means tap in always, every day, his Spirit moving in you. Be being filled is what that means in Greek. It doesn't translate in English too well. We don't talk like that, but that's what it means. Okay, be being filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I told us, you know, last week that we need to to invite the Lord, we need to, to pray the ancient prayer the church used to pray, three simple words. Pray this in your life, come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Invite him into your lives to yield to his leading and guiding and to continually be filled. And that's really where I want to pick up. Because we're not often continually filled. We're often not operating in the power we were called to, the the power we're supposed to. I told you the question that my mentor and friend brought to me years and years ago, and then it was in his book on the Holy Spirit as well. And this question is great. He says, how do I move from being a high-maintenance religious person to a highly effective Christian living out the presence of God. When he first said that to me, I realized I'm a high maintenance Christian most of the time because I want things my way. I want want things to go the way I want them to go and I want my opinions heard and, and so on and so forth. But I don't wanna be that. I wanna walk in what's, what this picture we looked at, I wanna walk in the kingdom. But like I said, most of us struggle, many people struggle to even understand the presence of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives, that we should have power, and and things that don't have power that are supposed to are frustrating, like cars that don't start, right? I told you the story that our our one car had been in an accident by someone in our family. It wasn't me. It wasn't my wife. (laughs) Anyway, no, it 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 was a small accident, but it damaged our car, and uh, you know, it had to be fixed, not a big deal. So it's in the shop, it's getting fixed, and then uh, the day it gets out of the shop, as I mentioned last week, our other car, Daisha's driving it home, and it starts stuttering and stalling, and it dies on her. She barely makes it home. And as I mentioned, I, I went and looked at it, and that's about all I know to do, 
and it definitely wasn't working just as my wife had said it wasn't working. And so, you know, the rest of the story is this. I, you know, in not knowing what to do with the car, I called a good friend of mine. I called his name is Chuck. I don't know if you're here, Chuck, or not. But uh, Chuck came over and, and, and looked at it. And like, I, I think all auto mechanics do this. I, I, this is my opinion, especially to people like me who know nothing about cars. Is they, when they ask you about the car, and they're like, can you tell me what sound it's making? Can you tell me what's wrong with it? And like, I don't know, I, all I know to do is like, it, it goes, you know, and I'm trying to, and then it goes, you know, I think auto mechanics line up for people like me to see us make those noises, you know, oh yeah, well, actually, no, tell him, he needs to know too what, what's going on. So, so, you know, I tell Chuck what's going on and he comes and looks at it and I'm hoping it's just the battery because I know how batteries work at least and uh, I'm hoping that's what it is and he takes a look at it and turns out he thinks it's much worse. And he says, he says, Nate, I think it's your, something went wrong with your timing chain. And I think, okay, <laughs> so I don't know what that means. And he's like, that's bad. <laughs> it's not good. And I, I said, well, okay, what does that mean? And he said, well, your timing chain kind of, it, it makes the, it synchronizes in rhythm with the crankshaft and camshaft and I don't know, some other big words. And, and he said, that's what it does and it keeps those things and if that goes off, it can be really bad and if you have a certain kind of engine, it can be even worse. And I said, oh, do I, what, what, what case do we have? He said, you have that kind of engine. <laughs> Like, oh, okay. So we, we call our mechanic who comes and gets it towed, and they, they take it in. And, and, of course, then again, I have to wah, trying to explain what happened to it. You know, and I'm sure they laugh. I mean, I just know they're laughing at me. And, uh, and then I go, oh, we'll take a look at it. And he calls me a few hours later and says, yeah, not, your timing chain came off. And not only that, your whole engine is shot. I'm like, oh, no. You know, that's not good. That's costly. He gave me the, you know, this is probably what it's going to cost. And... I think, well, you know, what are we going to do with this? And, and it, would just, it just, you know, I had to process that. And during the processing of that, thinking about what to do, I thought about this. It's because of the timing, the, the, and I'm not a mechanic, but the, 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 the lack of rhythm that happened, that whether it got loose or it, came, it, it wore out, the engine lost power, and it ultimately destroyed the engine. And it was in that moment as I was thinking about that that the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Nate, when you're not walking in step with me, when you're not living and walking in my spirit, you're gonna lose power. And ultimately, you're gonna face failure. You're gonna face catastrophic, because that's what he said, you had catastrophic engine failure. I mean, that sounds terrible, right? It's like, like bomb type level. Catastrophic. I love how Paul says this in Galatians 5, 25, in the midst of his context of the fruit of the Spirit, which we'll come back to. But he says this, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Say that again. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, some translations say, since we live by the Spirit, let us walk with the Spirit. But what's interesting about the Greek word here is that Paul uses a very unique word here that's different from most other places he uses the word that we translate walk. Because what he means is, he says, it's a, it's a keeping in step, in rhythm, in time. It's like a marching or dancing. That if we live by the Spirit, we keep in the rhythm of the Spirit. We keep in the flow of the Spirit. We li listen to his guidance. This summer, we took a, a team uh, that I was privileged to lead to Scotland uh, to do a mission trip, and we did some work in Scotland uh, with a missions organization, some outreach in Glasgow. And, and, and one night, though, we had a break, and we, we scheduled a thing where we hired a band, and, and we were able to kind of bless the missionary community there as well as the local community, and, uh, and we ha basically had a hoedown. Now, they, it's really, it's not, I've never been to a hoedown ever in my life, <laughs> and, uh, but I have been to what they call it, and it's, it predates the hoedown. It's called a Kaylee in, in Gaelic, and so we, we went to a Kaylee, and, and we, were, we got to dance, and uh, it was a lot of fun, uh, it, you know, except that I danced terribly, and I think I've tried to destroy any image or video that has me in it dancing because it's, it's scary, 
really is. But I have some video I want to show you because what's interesting, and so those who were there get to, may not know that they get to, to, to see this, but they call out the steps. And if you don't step with the right step, have you ever done this? You, don't, you, you mess up the whole thing. And it just falls apart and it's chaotic and, and then everyone tries to kind of get back on. And when I was doing it, I was trying to watch the, the guy in the killed who knew exactly what he was doing. I try to watch him and I'm stumbling all over the place. But I want you to watch this just for fun, this video of keeping in step. Looks like fun, right? Now, notice the ones who weren't in step. They kind of, you recognize it, right? We won't mention if they're anyone from our church at all. <laughs> but the truth is, when we're not in step, it falls apart. See, when we get out of step with the Spirit, we lose power in our lives. When we get out of step with the Spirit, we lose power. Yet we live in a society that's completely out of rhythm, out of sync, out of step, not just with the Spirit of God, but with the order that God had set from the beginning. He had set a pattern of rest, of Sabbath. And yet we live in a society that wants constant connection, media, social media, workaholicism, you know, the sleep deprivation levels are on an all-time high, obsession with wealth, with fame, and on and on and on. We're glued to our technology. And we've talked about, about that before, but we are living in a society that has no healthy rhythms, that has no pausing, and it's detrimental to our mental and physical and spiritual health. One study done by Microsoft, I, I couldn't believe this, I had to really double check this. One study by Microsoft shows that our attention spans, especially in the US, have continued to decline over time. Get this, according to this study, our average attention span is eight, not eight minutes, eight seconds. Eight seconds, the average attention span, eight seconds. Now get this, this is crazy. Goldfish can have a longer attention span than we do. Nine seconds, they got us by a second. The attention span of a goldfish is one second longer than our average attention span. Isn't that crazy? What they're finding is that they, in this research that those who multitask, and I try to pride myself in multitasking, those who, who multitask, try to get more done, are in fact more distracted and less productive. We're busier than ever and accomplishing less, is what they're saying. Isn't that crazy? We try to get more done and we end up being less productive. We're busier, we pack more and more into our lives, even the good things, but we have no balance and no rhythm. We're seeing more and more negative effects to this, rising depression rates, suicide breakdowns, crises, and so on, and yet we don't stop. We're stuck to our screens, our media, our work, and filling our lives with more and more stuff, completely afraid of stillness, of quiet, of, of silence. Another study done by the University of Virginia showed this, and this is, this is mind-blowing. 25% of women and 66% of men choose to receive electric shocks instead of being left alone with complete silence and no devices or anything for six minutes. They'd rather be electrocuted. <laughs> now, I don't know who signs up for these kinds of tests. But maybe they get paid good money, I don't know. Probably college students who are in need of a lot of money. I don't know, but you know, the, the truth is we are more distracted than ever. Isn't that, it's, it's insane. We're more distracted than ever. 25% of women, 66% of men can't handle six minutes of silence and would rather be electrically shocked. It's true in the church, too. We think the more we do, the more we add, even though we, we, we say the opposite, the, the more we're achieving for him, we're earning points, but burnout rates among church leaders and volunteers is continuing to rise. 75% of pastors report being extremely stressed out all the time. 91% report having experienced some form of burnout. 
See, for many of us, our timing chain is wearing thin or about to slip, or maybe it's even come off. And we are facing catastrophic life failure. We're hitting the wall. Some of us might be there. When I look at my own life and my own tendency to push and push and push, to continue to achieve and achieve and achieve, something I try to pride myself in, I realize that on my own, I'm losing power, I'm losing life. The more I try on my own power in my marriage and my work and my career and parenting and friendships and on and on, the more I strive in my own power, the more out of step I become. See, I know that I'm closer and out to being out of step when my anxiety rises, when my anger and frustration rises, when, when my temper is short. Guess what? That chain is a little bit off. When I find myself being critical and fault-finding and on and on, these are, these are signs that we're getting out of step with the Spirit. But God didn't intend this to be this way. He set up the rhythms of the Sabbath of rest, of stillness, not for religious observation, but for our own wholeness, the fullness of the life that we're supposed to be in. We need to move from this paralyzing sin of self-absorption and trust in his leading, in his step. I love the story of the prophet Zechariah who, who prophesied in the midst of, of Israel's return or Judah's return to the, to the promised land. They're rebuilding the temple. This is before Jesus, hundreds of years. They're building the city and, and they're in the midst of trying to accomplish, accomplish, accomplish. And Zechariah has a prophecy, a, a vision of what God is going to do ultimately through the Messiah. And in all their efforts and all the things they're doing, he says this, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You won't accomplish what you're trying to do on your own. It'll be me. It'll be my spirit. Be in step with me. So I want to go back to Galatians 5 that we looked at at the beginning, and I want to just look at a few verses around that, back a few verses. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians 5, through 26. If not, it'll be on the screen but Paul says this, famous passage, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited or provoking and envying each other. See, the passage is, is interesting because in the book of Galatians, Paul is dealing with division in the church doctrinally and morally. He's, he's saying, listen, you can't fix these things on your own. And you've tried to. How did you start with grace and now you're trying to do this all on your own? You can't do it. And so before this, and Mark did a sermon on this a few weeks ago with more detail. I won't go into it. Before it, he has this list of the acts of the flesh or the work of the flesh. If you go back a few verses, you'll see it. We won't for time's sake. But it's interesting, the, com the, the comparison, the works of the flesh compared to the fruit of the Spirit. See, the works of the flesh, what's interesting is the word for that, first of all, it means the work, the effort on our own, our own power. But the word for flesh that Paul uses is a unique word that Paul uses in, in a lot of his letters to talk about our fallen nature. It's a Greek word called sarx. Everyone say sarx. See, it makes me seem really smart if I use a Greek word, you know, but uh, no, it, it, it's, it's a simple word, but it's actually unique because what Paul's saying about the, the sarks is it's at opposition with the spirit. So the sark seeks to gratify itself. The flesh, he's not talking about flesh and bone. He's talking about our nature that is at odds with the spirit. And so he's saying those who work in the flesh, this is what you get. It leads to these terrible things. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. See, the one is the works, the other is the fruit. It's a product of something. We don't produce it on our own, though we should certainly endeavor for those things. The picture here is one that is a result of the Spirit working in us, changing our desires from the sarks to the Spirit. See, walking by the Spirit is when the desires of the Spirit overpower the desires of the flesh. That's walking in the Spirit. 
How do we get there? How do we, you know, my tendency when I see things like that is I must do more. I must work harder. I must go to church more. And yes, we do need to go to church and all those things. But it's almost this like, these are the things that will get me more in tune with the Spirit. And they will certainly help. But I think Paul had in mind the words of Jesus in John 15 when he wrote the fruit of the Spirit. See, that, that passage, which we'll look here in a second, we talks about being the vine. Jesus had just spoken to the disciples about that he would send the spirit of truth, he says. The paraclete in Greek, the, the one who would come and bring comfort, who would come alongside. And then he says this, I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Or he can use the word abide there. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. I think that's what they did with my car. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. See what he's saying here, and it's important especially as believers to recognize this, activity does not equal fruit. Activity does not equal fruit, love does. Just because we're busy, just because we have lots of stuff going on, that's not fruit. We have to first be rooted in the love of God. We must first know his love for us to be able to remain in him to abide in him. I love this story that a pastor in our movement who pastors in Hawaii and has pastored there a long time tells a story of a guy in his congregation named Bully. I don't know how he got that name. It's a nice name. He's, apparently Bully was actually a very nice, gentle man. And he was talking to Bully one day and they're at the beach and he noticed that Bully had massive scars on his hands, even somewhat deforming his hands and his feet. And, and Wayne, the pastor, says to Bully, he says, Bully, what happened? What are these scars come from? And Bully tells him a story. He says, well, in the 60s, I was at the beach here, and, and at this beach, uh, you know, the tide went out further than it had ever gone, and we'd never seen this. And so families and kids were out in the, in the tide pools catching fish and starfish and just having a great time when all of a sudden, and maybe you know this, what happens, a massive wave began to roll into the area they were in and the community they lived and, and people scattered off the beach and the devastation of the tsunami was terrible. And he, in his, in his desperation, was running to his home where his wife and his six-month-old son named Robbie was and he was running to catch up when he got there and the devastation had hit. And he sees his wife, she's holding onto a tree and she's sobbing and he, she says, Robbie's gone, Robbie's gone and he just snapped. He went into a different mode and he began to dig through the rubbish and the, the corrugated metal and all the different things and he's plowing through it all and he finds his son Robbie and he pulls him out like a football he says and he runs across all this debris and he gets back to his wife and there she's overjoyed she hugs him and, and then she's covered in blood because he she looks at him and he is bleeding everywhere and what happened what happened and in his just his love for his son, it just took over and he did everything in his power to rescue his son, even at his own expense. That's the love of God that we have to know to be able to abide first, that he would go through everything, even death on a cross, to rescue you. And we cannot abide in the spirit until we know that. So we start there. So how do we abide? How do we remain? First, we know his love. Second, I love how Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Psalm 46, the psalmist says in verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 
How do we abide? Stop. Be still. We abide by being still. It's the opposite of what our flesh would demand. It seems so contrary. We think we need to do, do, do. Appease, 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 whatever it is. And yet, what we to abide, we must be still. You can't, if you're a branch, you can't make yourself more a branch. You understand? You have to be connected. You have to abide. I must simply be, and to simply be, I must know I belong in the love of Christ. The power of stillness is profound. In Jewish tradition, it was said that most of them would pray at least three times a day. In fact, we have scriptures that talk about that. Kind of morning, midday, and evening. But David in Psalm 119, he said he, he praises the Lord seven times a day. And we have these pictures, and so it became part of the, the routine, the rhythm of the day of the people of God to pray, to, to, to think on the things of God throughout the day. That later became part of Christian tradition, and the early church practiced something that they called the daily office. Isn't that interesting? Maybe you've heard of it. If you're from a more traditional background, you've probably heard of this, at least, if not know more what it is. Daily office. The reason it was called the daily office, it comes from a Latin word that means to work. And so what they recognized was that the pausing moments of the day was the greater work than anything else they did. And so they practiced these pauses throughout the day. Now, unfortunately, over time, that became religious and, and became far more complicated than it was supposed to be. But the idea was rooted in Scripture that we would, we would stop and recognize the Lord. See, the point is, is not that it's a chore. David said it was a delight to do this. And Jesus himself would often draw away in prayer to be with his Father. If Jesus needed to pause, guess what? friends, so do we. If he needed to stop and be in the presence of his father, so do we. It's not how much or when. The point is the pausing, the rhythm, the keeping in step with his spirit. See, I believe this stillness forces us to recognize we're not in control. It does. Stillness forces us to recognize we're not in control. And I like control. Anyone else? I like things to go the way I plan, the way they should go. Stillness is, I'm basically saying, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. That's why the Sabbath was so important. And trust that God has it. And instead, be rooted in the presence of the one who really gives life to my soul. See, it's about trust. I want to be in control. But as Exodus 14, 14 says, as we read, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. To, to stop. To pause. See, secondly, stillness opens our eyes to his presence. Scripture tells us that we need to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Psalm 46.10, as we read, that he says, be still and what? Know that I am God. See, I am convinced that for many of us, the reason we aren't seeing God in our lives isn't because he isn't there. It's because we're not stopping or pausing, breathing, just resting to see him moving. In the midst of my struggle with the car situation, as silly as that is, God used that silly situation to remind me that I'm out of step with his spirit sometimes. And that I need to pause. I need to stop. Stillness opened our eyes to his presence. You may know the story of Elijah. I'll just tell you it real quick in the Old Testament where he has this, he's a prophet and he has great victory over the prophets of Baal and, and he wins, he sees God do this mighty miracle and his hope is that, that the, the king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife Jezebel would bring Israel to repentance and come back to the worship of Yahweh and instead she says, kill him. <laughs> And so he goes running off into the woods like a good prophet should. You know, he goes off into the wilderness. He's afraid. He's depressed. He's discouraged. He's at the end of his rope. His timing belt came off. 
And the Lord provides for him miraculously. And even on all his complaints, the Lord provides for him in the desert. Have you ever been that? Have you ever complained? And yet God still, his merciful hand is there. And the Lord leads him to the mountain of, of God, the Mount, Mount Horeb, where, where Moses had encountered God so long before in fire and, and thunder and all these things. And so he goes there and he expects God to move in fire and thunder and all that. And instead it says those things happen and God's voice was not in them. But he stops and he hears the still, small voice of God. Stillness. And what does the Lord say to him? He says, Elijah, I've not abandoned you. I've not left you alone. Not forsaken you. You're not done. Because Elijah thought his life was over. You're not done. And you know what? There are thousands still who have not bowed to Baal. You're not alone. He didn't hear that in all the uproar. He heard it in the stillness. See, stillness doesn't mean dropping all activity. Usually that's what happens when we burn out, we hit engine failure or we're about there. We stop everything. Stillness is about getting a rhythm in our life. Not that we don't need to create margins sometimes. But stillness is about stopping and pausing daily, breathing so that we can abide in him. See, abiding is about what we're drawing from. Who or what do you draw from in your weariness, in your frustration, in your pain, in your confusion, your anger, your doubt? Who or what do you draw from? What do you go to? Is it, is it entertainment, movies, media, all those kinds of things, games? What is it you're drawing from? Is it other people? Is it power? Is it money? All of those lead to catastrophic failure. And today, like in John 4, to the Samaritan woman, Jesus is saying, come, draw from me. Living water will never fail you. Come and taste and see. See, we, abiding is what we draw from, but stillness forces us to let go of the things we have been abiding in that keep us out of step. When I truly step into stillness, I step into surrender. See, stillness is surrender. It resets the timing chain of our lives to be in step with his spirit. We need to pause. We need to learn to pause. We need to learn stillness in our lives. There's an amazing surgeon, I read about this. He has a book called The Checklist Manifesto. And basically what he did is he was looking at the, the errors in, in hospitals and especially in surgical procedures that happen. You know, maybe uh, a sponge or something's left inside. You know, you hear about those kind of things that happen. And, and he, he looks at those things and he wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto. And what he did is he said you have to have pause points where you, you pause, even very short pauses. They were just a minute here or a minute there before anesthesia, before incision, before the operating room even. And each point was strategic, just long enough for the team to make basic checks on their checklist. Checking for everything that it's there and when they're done that it's back out, you know, those kind of things. And it wouldn't, you would think that these tiny little pauses wouldn't make a difference. But the results were profound. They found that in, by, in the spring of 2008, the eight hospitals that began using his checklist, his pause points, within months, the rate of complications for surgical patients had fallen by 36%. The rate of death dropped 47%. That's huge. And now these checklists are found in many hospitals around the country. They're basically like a speed bump to make you remember where you are, make you remember what matters. You know, we had a, in my old community in Idaho, we had a, a road that was a, um, you know, school zone. And in the summer, it was 45, but in school season, it was 25. And so 45 means 55, right? No, no police officers in the room. Sorry, I, 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 I tend to drive a little faster than I should and get in trouble, but... I'm, I forgot that it was uh, school season. And so I'm, the first part of the year, I'm driving 55 and a 25. Now, anyone know that that's not good, right? That's a lot faster than you should go. And there was a speed bump, and I, I slowed down to hit that. And I thought, oh my gosh, I totally forgot. And so I, but of course, a police officer was there, and he caught me and pulled me over, and you know, he's 
uh, do you know how fast you were going? And I'm like, yeah. And he was actually, he let me off. He said, I realize the new year, just remember to slow down. We need that. We need somebody to, we need someone to say, slow down. We need that speed bump. We need that pause point in our life that says slow down. What's amazing is this surgeon's pause points now affected other industries. You know who, who, who they benefited as well? Pretty, if you, anyone travel? Pilots. <laughs> We're glad that they stop and have pause points if anyone's flown, right? We need to pause because stillness is surrender. It's saying, I trust you. I trust you. Stillness is surrender. As we, as we close, I'm going to invite you to do something. I'm going to challenge you this week to find three times a day. I know that's crazy to ask this, but I'm going to challenge you three times a day to take five minutes and just pause, to stop. Maybe it's in a car ride to work or, you know, Maybe it's at your lunch break or, or something, somewhere where you can pause. And if you're like me, if I stop, I immediately start thinking of the 10 million things I need to do. So I want to give you three things to do instead to help you. Simple. Take these times, and, and I'm, I'm promising you, when we pause, when we get in step with his spirit, we'll change our lives. So pause and do these three things. First, pause and invite him. As I said last week, come Holy Spirit. How many times would it have been better before you said something to have paused? Or before you made a rash decision to have paused and said, come Holy Spirit. Before I make this stupid mistake, come. <laughs> come, Holy Spirit. Invite him into your daily life. Ask, scripture says, ask him to fill you. Come, Holy Spirit. Invite him into your life. And that, even though that's all you say, those three words that I gave you last week, come, Holy Spirit. Number two, praise him. As we read in, in Ephesians, that to be, be, be being filled and, and build each other up with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's something about the power of praise because it forces the focus off of me. Find one thing, one attribute of God to praise him. Lord, you are so merciful. I don't deserve your love, but yet you've poured it out on me. Lord, you're so mighty. There, who is like you? None can compare. One phrase, one praise. And third, thank him. Chris, in the midst of worship, asked us to, to kind of reflect and to think of something to be thankful for. My goodness, if we did that every day of our lives? Thank him for, for who he's who he, who he is in your life. Thank him that he's rescued you from death. Thank him for the people in your life. Thank him for something. He's done so much. Thank him, invite him, praise him, thank him. And just pause in those moments. Let there be stillness in your life. Get back in sync with his spirit. So I'm gonna invite us to do something different this morning. I'm gonna give us a few minutes and I actually want you in your seats where you are, just between you and God, even no matter where you're at this morning. And I want you to take, we'll leave this thing up on the screen here, but take uh, these minutes to just do that very thing right now between you and him. Invite him. Even if that's all you, come Holy Spirit. And then just a word of praise to who he is. word of thanksgiving and I want to just take a few minutes and let you do that pause be still
Holy Spirit. Open our eyes, open our ears, Lord, as your word says. We invite you into our lives, Lord. We invite you into homes that are struggling, marriages that are struggling, finances, fear, depression, anxiety, hopelessness, loneliness. Come, Holy Spirit. Comforter. We invite you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we praise you. We praise you for your unfailing love. that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Even when we doubt, even when we struggle, Lord, you are near. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. We praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence that restores and renews We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross where you paid the ultimate price that we might have fullness of life. Paying the cost of our sin so that we could know the fullness of you. We thank you. pause. We need stillness, friends. I want to invite us to sing, to stand together, and we're going to sing a part of the song that we sang earlier. It invites us to recognize this truth that we've been saying, that He is, He's here. He's always present. So let's declare that, that He is the one who conquers darkness and sets us free, and then we'll close together.
darkness tremble in our lives. You are stilling our hearts. So we invite you, Lord, daily into our lives. Lord, may we be in step with your spirit. You know, some of you here this morning as we close, there may be some of you who've never known the invitation that Jesus said to the woman at the well that he has paid the price, but he's made a way for you to have rivers of living water, life abundant. He's paid the price for your sins. He, he gave his life so that you could have new life in him. And he's saying, come and taste and see the goodness of God. If that's you this morning and you want to know that goodness, you want to know that living water, just with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if that's you, could you raise your hand where you are? Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. In the back, I see you. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for those who've raised their hand. Lord, we pray, Lord, that they would they would know you've forgiven them, you've set them free, that you've paid the price, that they can now know you and walk with you in fullness and know the rivers of living water that you promise, Lord. Your presence with us always, God. We thank you, Lord. Secondly, I, I think some of us here, to use my analogy, some of us, the timing belt is off. Or maybe it's almost off and it's slipping. Some of you, it's been you're in complete failure. You've been trying to fix it, you're pushing, you're trying, doing everything you can to make it work. And Jesus is saying, be still. Be still. Maybe others, you've, you've tried and tried and the engine is long gone and you feel you've failed and you've continued to fail and you've given up on all the things that matter and you've given up on hope. But to the same, he said, Jesus is saying, come and taste and see. Come be still, come know, come abide in me. Like he said to Elijah, you're not done yet. I'm not done with you. I am still with you. I will always be with you. If you breathe new life into you, and if you're in any of those places or you just need a freshness of his spirit this morning to be, be being filled, that's you this morning. Could you just raise your hand? I, I want to read a scripture over us this morning. Amen. There's, yeah, anyone else? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Lord, fill these people. Breathe freshness of your spirit, freshness of life. Lord, living water flow into these people. Lord, you are the spirit. You are the light. And so, Lord, may they rest in you you, Lord, and be in step with you. There's this famous passage that I want to read out of Ezekiel, where the, the prophet is given a vision of, of, of the restoration of brokenness, of failed, catastrophic failure, like some of our lives today. Maybe we're at different levels of that, but this is the vision, this is the picture he gave, and I hope you receive it brings life to your life, to life to your bones this morning. And he says, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. And in this vision, he, he, the Lord says to him, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a 
vast army. There are some of us here where there's, we're, we're, we're dry bones this morning and the Lord is saying, I wanna breathe fresh life into you. Maybe it's, in, maybe it's in areas of your life, but there's a freshness that he wants to pour out into your life, a newness of his spirit, a freshness of his spirit that he wants to bring life to your bones. This is the work that God is always doing, bringing life where there was no life, hope where there was no hope, joy where there was no joy. This is what he's doing in you and in me. So be still and receive the breath of God. Amen. Father, let it be so this morning. May breath your ruach, your spirit, Lord, as it is in Hebrew. Lord, that it would blow afresh on us every day as we learn to be still and keep in step with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, there are folks up here who would, are available for any prayer. If you need prayer for any reason, please take that opportunity to come up and receive that prayer. Uh, they'd love to pray with you. Otherwise, be blessed. Have a great week and a wonderful Thanksgiving. God bless.